Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm a senior contributing editor with Data Science Central and also chief data scientist for Data Magnum. I'd like to start our event off today by thanking Tableau for sponsoring today's event. Tableau is a wonderful supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Pivotal, Microsoft, Hortonworks, Oracle, IBM, and Teradata, to name just a few. Uh, these past webinars are all, are all available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you haven't had an opportunity to view them, I'd encourage you to take a look as they provide some very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of current interest to our data science community. Today's webinar is entitled, All Recipes, Growing the World's Largest Digital Food Brand Through Digital Visual Visualization. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Uh, this will be a one hour long event. We have a single panelist that I'll introduce in just a minute. There will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A following the presentation. And this event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com in the next few days following today's live event. I'd also like to encourage all of our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Grace Priyapong Pasan of All Recipes. Grace is Vice President of Business Intelligence at All Recipes, where she leads a nine-person business intelligence team. She leads the company's Center of Excellence for Cross-Organizational Data, Insights, and Optimization to identify opportunities and support key business strategies. Grace has an extensive background in web and mobile analytics, including A-B and multivariate testing. She also has a deep background in web development, user-centered design, and user behavior analysis. Grace, thanks for being with us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Now, uh, All Recipes, the world's largest digital food brand, receives more than a billion visits annually from home cooks around the world across PCs, smartphones, and tablets. In today's Data Science Central webinar, we'll see how All Recipes is leveraging data visualization to bring real-time digital food behavior insights to their internal teams, the media, technology partners, and the world's largest consumer packaged goods brands in actual, timely, and meaningful ways. Grace will also discuss their Tableau deployment, growing adoption, and uses in marketing, public relations, sales, and improved customer experience. Grace, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Great. Thank you, Bill, and thanks to Data Science Central and Tableau for inviting me to talk about something that is um, very exciting and interesting to me, and I don't get as many opportunities to share uh, what we're working on here at All Recipes as I'd like, so um, this, this is definitely a pleasure for me. Um, so just to kick off, um, a little bit about All Recipes. Our mission is to inspire the world to discover and share the joy of home cooking. Um, we are a team here at All Recipes in Seattle of about 140 employees, and we are all really uh, focused and centralized around um, that mission. And I don't know that a lot of people know this, but All Recipes has been around for quite some time. Um, we're about 18 years old, which, which is ancient um, in terms of Internet years. Uh, we started off as cookierecipes.com back in 1997, uh, founded by a group of web developers and uh, UW grad students um, who really wanted to use this new thing called the Internet to create a community where home cooks could really share um, treasured family recipes and share their experiences, their cooking experiences, and we really live uh, that same spirit today. Um, All Recipes is 
part of the Meredith family, and Meredith um, is comprised of some very well-known brands like Better Homes and Gardens, Martha Stewart, and we're part of the Meredith Digital Group, which is about 600 um, employees in, uh, in New York, Des Moines, and also now in Seattle. And Meredith Digital represents um, a wide variety of different brands from food to home and parenting and fitness and beauty. So brands like Eating Well, as I mentioned, Better Homes and Gardens, Martha Stewart, Shape and Fitness, and um, All Recipes is a fairly fairly new addition uh, to that mix. Um, I'm going to go through uh, my team, our data infrastructure. I'm going to talk through some of the challenges we've been working through in our business intelligence and in, in growing business intelligence here at All Recipes and talk through a couple of examples. I don't have a live demo. Um, I didn't want to deal with any kind of technical difficulty in getting a live demo up and going, but I do have some really good examples of some work that we've developed for our sales teams and our advertising partners, as well as some very new work um, that, um, that we're really kind of in the midst of right now, which is a really good example of how we're using um, data in real time to optimize our content. Um, Go ahead and forward the slide here. So All Recipes is probably one of the biggest sites that you, maybe you've never heard of. If you are a cook and you search for recipes, it's very likely that you're going to see All Recipes in the search results um, because we do have a very strong search footprint. Um, pancake recipes, hopefully we're number one today, but that's probably one of the biggest uh, uh, searches that drives traffic to our site. Um, you can see here on this slide, we're 40 million uniques. Uh, that's 40 million home cooks and shoppers that come to the site um, every month. Um, in terms of size, if you're not a cook, we're similar in size to BestBuy.com, uh, similar in size to NBCNews.com, CNET.com, and NFL.com. And uh, that's all based on Comscore data. Um, it's great that we are similar in size to some of those particular sites, but where we really aspire um, is to be uh, bigger than we are. Um, so we set our sites kind of at the level of Pinterest, New York Times, ESPN. So we're about half the size of those particular um, uh, sites in terms of unique visitors. Um, what differentiates us from some of the other food sites out there is really the majority of our content. 90% of our content is user submitted. Um, again, we have collected and amassed a huge amount of personal histories in the form of recipes from our users over this uh, nearly 20 years that we've been around. Um, we have almost 2 million user submitted recipes. About 50,000 of those recipes are actually available on the site. The remainder are, are very personal, and um, those, are, those are things that people either have submitted or have not yet, uh, we haven't yet published to our site. Um, we have over a million photos on the site. We have over 5 million ratings and reviews. And you can see that we are available across multi-platforms. So we are, in terms of domain for domain, the number one food brand online today. And you can access us via, via desktop, tablet, mobile phone. We have a very popular uh, mobile app called Dinner Spinner, um, which has amassed about 23 million cumulative downloads. Um, we have over 110 million video views a year. Um, in terms of visits, 1.5 million, and we are truly global. We have 19 sites um, in 24 countries in 13 different languages, and all of those sites um, are very localized for the individual countries um, that they represent. So we have um, a big international team here at All Recipes that uh, develops the content for those countries. Um, and even though uh, we're headquartered in Seattle, we get uh, native uh, speakers of the different languages and people who have been uh, uh, live and raised in these countries to really uh, tailor the content to those particular audiences. So we have uh, a UK site, we have a Brazil site, so really um, we're, we're, we're definitely a global brand. And 
the fact that we're global and the fact that we're multi-channel across all of these devices uh, really speaks to the fact that we want to reach um, a consumer audience at the right time in the right place with the right message with the right content. So content, premium content is very, very important to us um, in reaching those consumers. We have a very strong consumer footprint and our content is highly, highly relevant to the consumer audience. So um, this slide has some data that's uh, pulled from um, a, a Nielsen product. It's MRI fusion data. Um, it's based on both offline and online media usage by U.S. consumers um, and incorporates both uh, survey data and clickstream data. And from this, this really speaks to the strength of our audience. 94% of our audience is always looking for new recipes to try. So they're not just looking for the tried and true. They're very exploratory, looking for new things, uh, new um, trends. They're looking for uh, ways to experiment um, in terms of, of the cooking challenges that they're, that they're excited by in their homes. 90% um, of, our, of our audience uses recipes uh, to inform their shopping lists. So they are using shopping lists and these recipes in store. 81% um, cook frequently at home. This was a little bit surprising to me because I am an avid cook and I would have thought this number would have been much higher, but I think it really speaks to the fact that food is not just about cooking. Um, our audience is not just about um, the, the, the tactics of getting into the kitchen and making a meal. It really is about a celebration and it's really aspirational that food in, in a lot of ways for a lot of people is entertainment. Um, 50%, this to me was a really fascinating metric, 50% of our audience are in store within 24 hours of visiting allrecipes.com and also half of them are shopping uh, two plus times a week. So our audience is a very strong consumer. Um, the audience, not surprisingly, is predominantly female. Uh, Meredith does, you know, um, uh, content, uh, feature content that um, is targeted at um, multiple stages of, of women's lives, but we are about two-thirds uh, female in terms of our audience. 40% uh, of our audience is um, with it between the ages of 25 and 49. Um, household income, half of our audience is in the 75K plus household income bracket and have uh, 33 or more people in the household. So um, in terms of scale, we are fairly, fairly sizable. So given the fact that we have a very large audience and we've been around a long time, naturally you would imagine we have quite a bit of data, and we do. Um, our BI discipline is fairly new. Um, we really only started um, actively and aggressively utilizing all of the data that we collect about two years ago. So currently, I think Bill mentioned in the intro, my team is nine people. Um, I'm really excited to say we're going to be able to hire two additional people. So we have a web analytics engineer and a tag management engineer uh, that we're hiring for as well as a senior business analyst. But my team is heavily skewed towards analysts. And when I start to talk about um, the challenges that we've experienced in really growing this discipline, it comes from the fact that we are analyst heavy and a little bit short on engineers. So I've got four engineers, seven analysts, um, but I'm excited to say that, that we are growing. But as I mentioned, we're fairly nascent in this endeavor. Two years. Um, this slide here shows uh, our data sources, the systems that we use to uh, warehouse the data and the way that we surface the um, information to our, our stakeholders. And this particular stack, yes, is two years old. Two years old. So um, we uh, started to use Redshift as our data warehouse platform in July of 2013, um, uh, started to use Tableau a couple months later, and our deployment right now 
we sort of like to think about it um, in terms of speed plus controlled chaos. Um, this is something that I've been talking to a lot of other um, folks about, um, particularly in the context of using Tableau, is that, that we're all sort of figuring out how to, to, um, to apply some data governance um, in an environment where you are constantly building things and trying to get information surfaced to uh, the business stakeholders as quickly as possible. Um, but prior to um, Tableau and Redshift, we were primarily using uh, Microsoft SQL Server um, and Excel. So three years ago, I would say about 99% of all of our reporting was hand done in Excel. Um, the team was about half the size as it, uh, as it is now, but we were all just sort of heads down doing our reporting in Excel, using a lot of things like VLOOKUPs to join up data sets. Um, and uh, some SSRS reporting, but because we didn't have as many engineers um, as we'd like to do a, a wider SSRS uh, deployment, um, we had just a handful of, of reporting automated in SSRS. Today, two years later, I would say that about 90% of our reporting is automated using uh, Redshift and um, other data aggregations uh, with Tableau layered on top. Uh, we do have some microstrategy reporting, and we're still we're still churning some stuff out in Excel, although that is definitely um, um, going away, thankfully. Not that there's anything wrong with Excel. I think Excel will always be an analyst's uh, a sidekick. Um, but anything scalable and recurring and repeatable, uh, more and more the, our analyst team is um, looking to Tableau as, as a solution for, for surfacing information. Um, our Tableau deployment is continuing to grow, although I still feel like we're still um, trying to catch up. Um, we've got about 15 desktop users, 50 server interactors. Um, we have about 30 published data sources and about 100 plus published views. And like I said, right now it's really all about getting as much information out into the hands of our stakeholders and trying to uh, manage some of the, the chaos and all of the information we're putting out there outside of a very rigorous kind of a taxonomy or plan in terms of um, how we're surfacing that information. Um, you can see here at the bottom our sources are, are varied. Um, I would say our primary data sources are from Adobe and DoubleClick. So we're getting um, raw granular log level information from both DoubleClick and um, uh, Adobe. And we are bringing our Adobe Omniture data feed data into Redshift. And, we get about 20 to 30 million hits a day, and if there's anybody out there that's familiar with the Adobe data feed, it's fairly large, I think 500 columns um, by 20 to 30 million records um, for us is, is pretty sizable, and we bring all of that at the transactional level into our data warehouse. Um, we have also started to bring in our um, DFP or our double-click data, so that's all of our ad impression data, not just for all recipes, but for the entire Meredith network um, into Teradata. And um, that data set um, is 40 to 70 million impressions or, or records per day. Uh, so again, another extremely sizable uh, data set, and, and we're really kind of new in figuring out how we want to um, use and um, process this information because it is um, so massive um, and uh, and, and really how we as a business want to use, use that data. Uh, we also get a lot of other information from um, like Pinterest and Facebook. We use their APIs to get aggregated information. Um, Brightcove is our video player, so we get a lot of detailed information um, about uh, the videos that people consume on our site. Um, and uh, we get uh, data from Google Webmaster Tools around search. Um, search is a really big part of our um, audience development strategy, as well as really kind of the success of all recipes has been driven by search and our philosophy around surfacing um, pre
premium content. So we do a lot of optimization around figuring out what is the content that people are looking for in search engines related to recipes and cooking uh, topics and um, helping our content and editorial team figure out uh, where the content gaps are on our site. So really a varied environment, and like I said, we're still really new in figuring out how to bring all this disparate data together. And also on disparate platforms, um, we're figuring out how to uh, connect our Amazon Redshift data to the data that lives in Teradata, and we're also venturing into um, a, a machine learning um, proof of concept um, working with Microsoft and, and Azure. So I'm going to talk through a couple of examples of the work that we're doing and how we're using visualizations to, um, to surface information and do some of that optimization that we're talking about. Uh, the first example that I want to talk through um, has to do with surfacing food trends. So um, we, we developed a series of reports that we like to call hot sheets. And these hot sheets um, we're designed to create quick information for our sales teams. So our sales teams go out and meet with really big brands um, to talk about uh, the Meredith product offering, um, particularly, I mean, the thing that I'm focused on is uh, the food-related uh, vertical here at Meredith. And we were experiencing really a backlog in in delivering and, and supporting our ad sales team. So if our ad sales team had to respond to a big RFP and they needed data around um, all recipes audience or what kinds of uh, food trends could we highlight, um, we were constantly having to scramble to get that information together for them. And everything was very one-off. So if someone was meeting with, say, an advertiser that was interested in breakfast products, we would hurry, put together that Excel report um, that would highlight, you know, all recipes, users, breakfast consumptions, what kinds of breakfast recipes were people looking at, when were people looking at breakfast recipes. And because I had, you know, three or four analysts at the time, we didn't really have good control over the quality of the work going out. Um, a lot of that was because people were doing things in a hurry, um, oftentimes the sales team would reach out because they were um, in a pinch needing something turned around quite quickly. And so what we found was that after a couple of years of doing this, we started to see patterns in what people were looking for and asking for. Um, there were very specific topics um, that would come up over and over again. Um, there were uh, uh, the same types of questions coming up over and over again. And so what we were able to do was uh, use Tableau to build these canned templated reports that we could produce very quickly and get them into the hands of our sales team as well as our um, advertising partners to help inform their campaigns. Um, so these hot sheets, we developed around 40 different food topics, and they range from seasonal topics, so for things that are popular during certain holidays, to um, particular ingredients like pasta, uh, to particular cooking um, techniques like barbecuing and grilling. And so what I'm going to talk through is um, our hot sheet on barbecue and grilling and pasta. So um, I wanted to make sure with any of these presentations that I include lots of uh, food photos. So um, as I get into some of the data, I'm, I'm not, I don't have as many food photos, so I wanted to keep this slide up as long as I could because uh, who doesn't love looking at food photos? Um, so I'm going to talk through pasta and barbecue and grilling, and I do also want to mention that all of this analysis is only possible because we have an amazing uh, taxonomy team that categorizes and classifies all of our content. So the classification process is 
living and breathing. It's constantly changing, but it's also baked into our recipe publication process. Um, every recipe, as it's brought into um, that the All Recipes database, is categorized. Uh, we have about 2,000, over 2,000 different attributes available to our editorial team to classify the content by. And so we have this very rich taxonomy in order to take those um, 50,000 recipes that we have published on the site and expand that you know, to the million um, to really bubble things up, roll them up into these food-related trends. So um, our hot sheets. Uh, this is a page from our barbecue and grilling hot sheet. So what's interesting is, is that these hot sheets are um, – are, are static. They represent two full years worth of data, so we can do some year-over-year -year comparisons. Um, and the audience is really uh, our sales team and our advertising partners. So we wanted to make sure that, that these reports included insights. And by insights, I mean that there was a very strong narrative around how to understand this data. So I know that this is not easy to read in this particular format, but the thing that I want to highlight is for insights, my team never delivers anything that is just a chart or a table, um, and, and we can't call that insights if it's just charts and tables. Um, the insights piece comes in the interpretation of the information, and that's really what we were aiming for in developing these hot sheets, knowing that our sales team has to um, react and act very quickly to opportunities. Um, we wanted something that could be easily consumable and something that includes the narrative um, that they're going to have to bring bring to advertisers. So um, on this, on page one here, you can see we've got three different charts. Um, we wanted to be able to highlight when this particular content category is popular. So the very first chart on the left shows um, by month um, the year-over-year -year growth, so the gradient is the year-over-year -year growth or change um, in page views for this particular content. And then the height of the bar shows um, relative popularity of, of this particular category. So the gray line is all recipes typical traffic patterns. So what you can see in barbecue and grilling is that April, May, June, July, and August really are the biggest uh, barbecue and grilling um, times of the year. But there's also some really interesting growth happening um, in the fall as evident by, by the orange um, gradient on those, on those bars. Now, we don't only look at seasonal popularity or popularity by month. We also look at um, slices uh, by hour of day and day of week. And what we wanted to be able to show, particularly by hour of day, is when are people consuming this content? Not when was the site getting the most traffic, but when are our users, no matter where they are, what time zone they're in, are they actually coming to the site to look at this content? So barbecue and grilling, you can see, tends to um, peak very early in the morning or very late in the evening. And um, we'll look at this data relative to um, pasta. And I've got some uh, theories on why this may be. But you can also see that barbecue kind of bucks the all recipes trend. So that gray line shows that our typical traffic peaks around four in the evening. Um, I mean, it, it's growing all, you know, throughout the um, mid-morning to late afternoon time periods, I think, as people are, are thinking about what to make for dinner, and then toward trails off um, later in the evening. But barbecue and grilling shows the opposite pattern. Um, day of week is also very important to us in terms of surfacing when content is um, uh, most interesting to people or when uh, particular uh, topics are most interesting to people. So you can see, based on that gray line again, all recipes tends to have its highest traffic day on Sunday. So maybe as we're all thinking of that big Sunday dinner, we've got time to cook. Um, we see most traffic on the site at that time. And then later in the week, um, you know, maybe if people are kind of tired from their work week, they're not thinking about cooking so much. Friday tends to dip. Maybe we're eating out. Um, you can see, again, barbecue and grilling kind of defies that trend that really Thursday, Friday are the big 
grilling days. Um, in these hot sheets, like I said, we wanted to address some of the more common questions. We were getting a lot of the same questions around these topics. Um, what people are really interested in in terms of these topics are really the most searched for, most printed, things that really kind of, they, they wanted lists. Our sales team really wanted lists of the most popular. Um, and so uh, these hot sheets are really rich with lists. On this particular slide, you can see the recipes most likely to end up in the cart. So again, we use gradient to show the trend. And then the uh, order of the list is in popularity. So on this one, you can see for barbecue and grilling, the recipe that is most likely to be added to someone's shopping cart is uh, broiled tilapia parmesan. But the fastest growing uh, recipe in terms of um, add to cart or add to a shopping list um, interactions is unbelievable chicken. Um, all time most loved recipes. So this is um, people actually clicking the heart icon to make that recipe a favorite and saving that recipe to, um, to their all recipes uh, recipe box. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure to address or communicate the scale of, of this particular topic. So um, in this section, annual recipe performance, um, we call out how many recipes does this particular category um, contain. So you can see at the time that we published this particular hot sheet, we had uh, 1,909 um, recipes in this category. It was printed an average of uh, 1,200 times, 1,300 times in a year. Um, but what's really interesting is looking at recipe box saves or, or favoriting a recipe. So for, for this particular category, 2.3 million uh, saves to um, all recipe members' uh, recipe boxes. Um, we also call out uh, most popular ingredients. So we have a very robust, rich ingredient database um, that we uh, also like to surface um, in these reports. Um, so based on or depending on the recipe that you see or, or um, the topic of the hot sheet, you can see all of the ingredients um, that are, or a, a list of 20 ingredients that are common to these recipes. And what this shows, what this provides is a peek into what is likely in all recipes audience um, pantry. Um, not surprisingly, salt is the number one ingredient on every one of these hot sheets. Salt is, is the number one ingredient. Uh, but we really wanted to, to surface that because if we were to um, exclude that, it just it, it tended to raise a lot of questions when we didn't include that. But um, uh, salt, ground black pepper, butter, which was surprising to me for a grilling topic. But um, this, inf this information is so fascinating. Every time you look at um, uh, what people are cooking and what people are doing, you learn a lot about, um, about our audience and um, about people and their food preferences. Um, for food trends, most of these reports look the same. But the power comes when you look at the breadth of, of these uh, food trend reports that we've developed because you start to see that there is so much seasonality in these particular topics and in the ingredients or the cooking methods. Um, it seems obvious, but because our traffic patterns are so predictable, uh, for us it really became um, uh, enlightening to start to dive into these individual topics. So here I've got barbecue and grilling versus pasta in terms of seasonal popularity. So you can again see uh, the all recipes trend where uh, we start off January pretty strong. Uh, some of our traffic drops off around April, May, June, and then picks up again in September. Um, barbecue and grilling, you can see those peaks, but what's fascinating um, is pasta and the fact that pasta is really an evergreen ingredient. It's always popular, so it's, uh, it doesn't have necessarily any strong peaks. Um, clearly in October, November, and December, our cooking habits change, so pasta is not as popular in those months as we're all sort of focused on 
turkeys and cookies and uh, pumpkin pies. Um, but seasonality is not just limited to uh, the months of a year. We also see seasonality in terms of day of week. So we've already looked at the barbecue and grilling. We know that barbecue and grilling is really all about the weekend, people wanting to get outside and celebrate the end of a week. So you see those spikes on Thursday and Friday. And I think it, it one hypothesis we have around Thursday and Friday being popular um, days of the week for starting to look at that uh, recipe content is the fact that a lot of recipes call for marinades and you want to marinade uh, those proteins usually the day before you plan on cooking them. Um, it works. It's a technique that you know creates delicious, delicious food. So um, we that's why we think we start to see a Thursday and Friday trend being really popular uh, for barbecue and grilling. Now, pasta is completely different. Pasta is a Monday through Friday ingredient. So you can see that those um, orange bars uh, over-index uh, relative to the all recipes, typical traffic trends. So um, one takeaway that you know our sales team will highlight to advertisers based on your product, there's definite seasonality in terms of month of the year, day of the week um, for these particular categories. And then to get even more granular uh, by hour of day. So you can see um, just like uh, I mentioned barbecue and grilling, you kind of have to plan ahead for the most successful product, um, we think that the fact that people are, are planning to marinate this, the, their proteins or vegetables prior to grilling, that's why we tend to see traffic, uh, relative traffic to that category, spiking in the later evening as people prepare that marinade, put it in their refrigerator um, to cook the, the next day. Pasta tends to follow more of the all recipes typical trend. Again, it is more of kind of the workhorse ingredient. That day of week um, produces, you know, a very satisfying meal um, in most cases and in, in relatively little time. So you can see that people are thinking about pasta throughout the day, peaking just before the dinner hour. So that is an example of the food trends work um, that we have put together for our sales team um, and also internally and kind of looking at the differences between um, barbecue and grilling and pasta. And we see a lot of these differences across all of the, the different 40 uh, topics that we've, we've um, compiled this reporting Four. So this last slide is just comparing the different recipes and the different ingredients. So whereas barbecue and grilling is really all about um, in the popular ingredients categories here, um, seasonings, herbs, um, pasta is very different. It's about kind of the the way that you build flavor uh, for pasta, so grilled uh, ground cheese, uh, black pepper, butter, milk, eggs. So really interesting patterns um, around what people are cooking and the kinds of ingredients that they're using um, and when people are focused on, on preparing these different types of recipes. The other example that I want to walk through is something that is brand new. Um, we are really excited about this particular project um, because it's something a little bit different uh, than we, what we've done before in terms of how we use our data. Um, and it really is, is going to inform a lot of the uh, optimization that we plan on doing um, with our content and editorial teams. So um, this project was really um, aimed around understanding what drives the success of a recipe. So what is the right set of ingredients and instructions for a recipe to make that recipe popular? So as I've titled the slide, what's the recipe for a recipe? So we set out to, to develop this understanding um, uh, at the beginning of the year 
and our objective was really to understand those factors that influence how popular a recipe is. So um, back in September of 2013, the Washington Post published an, art, published an article about um, a recipe, an All Recipes recipe, uh, by an All Recipes member um, named John Chandler. Um, uh, and they called it, possibly the most popular recipe on the English-speaking Internet. So World's Best Lasagna by John Chandler was cited as the most viewed recipe online. That recipe is, at the time that the article was written, 12 years old, so now it's about um, uh, uh, 14, almost 15 years old. So what we wanted to understand was how do we get – that kind of popularity associated to other recipes in less than 12 to 15 years? How, what, 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 what were the factors that, that created um, that popularity? So what we set out to do was publish three groups of recipes um, that spanned multiple categories. So uh, 26 recipes across multiple categories ranging from breakfast recipes to beverage recipes, appetizers, and desserts. And um, these three groupings, uh, we applied two different treatments. Uh, one received no treatment, that was our control, and the two treatments were um, a combination, well one treatment was content marketing, so on-site promotion of this content. And then the second treatment was uh, that content marketing, that same content marketing, um, along with um, our, a brand ambassador push. So All Recipes has a group of brand ambassadors. They are our super users. Um, they are an amazing bunch of, of, of folks, um, home cooks, um, who are really All Recipes enthusiasts. And so we engaged um, that group of brand ambassadors to, um, and we encouraged them to create content for um, one set of, of recipes. Um, they submitted photos, ratings, and reviews. So we wanted to see the impact of content marketing alone, content marketing along with um, photos, ratings, and reviews, or seeding um, the content with ratings, uh, photos, and reviews, and then a recipe without any of that intervention. So um, getting the traffic, getting the ratings and the photos uh, without any kind of push, um, seeing that happen um, organically. Uh, so we, we started this initiative in February. So all of these recipes were launched on the site in February. And uh, we just started our analysis, which I'll go through some of our preliminary findings. And uh, we're continuing um, to do our analysis on this data set. So just to quickly go through what we found, and then I'll go into the visualizations, because like I said, this is all very real time and very new. Um, we published three sort of recipe categories. So we published our lemon garlic chicken recipe, and there are the three versions. And what we found was that the uh, treatment of the uh, All Stars brand ambassadors seeding photo ratings and reviews content, plus the content marketing, produced uh, uh, page views six times over the control. So you can see here, this is the, uh, the in the center, the content marketing piece, the, the recipe that only got content marketing, and then the control, which um, got no uh, additional promotion. Um, on the next slide, the third recipe type was a lemon cake. And uh, you can see here again that uh, the All Recipes All Stars or the Brand Ambassadors Plus Content Marketing produced significant lift over the controls, so 46 times more page views uh, with that treatment than the control. And then lastly, Chicken Linguini was the third uh, recipe. And Interestingly, uh, this one, um, the content marketing only uh, treatment was the winner with 46 times more page views over the control. So 
I'll get into some of the uh, visualizations now. Again, this is all this is all very brand new. Uh, my team is looking at this data right now, and we're using Tableau as as the data discovery platform. So we're bringing all of this data in from our data warehouse and looking at what's going on. So you can see here the three different recipes that we. We published lemon garlic chicken, lemon cake, and chicken linguine. Um, you can see that the lemon garlic chicken, um, really in terms of, of page views, so the bar charts at the top here are relative page views, really was by, by far kind of the breakout um, uh, popular recipe. And for us here at All Recipes, that is not surprising. Chicken is the most popular ingredient here at All Recipes uh, or among our, our audience. And so what we really found fascinating here is that the uh, lemon garlic chicken was even organically uh, very popular. So you can see the gray bar there, the lemon um, garlic chicken breasts organically got a lot of traffic. Um, the line charts below here show the content marketing push. So where we've got these annotations, it shows when we promoted this content via uh, the content marketing um, uh, treatment. So uh, the Daily Dish newsletter is a one-day feature in our newsletter. A recipe of the day is um, – uh, when we uh, feature uh, a particular recipe on our home page, but we also ran uh, banner ads. So you can see on the lemon cake, uh, we launched a banner ad, and that banner ran for about a month. So you can see that the uh, page views picked up um, for the month, and then actually lemon cake, that big spike was Easter. Um, so uh, Easter was really a good time to feature something like lemon cake. Um, I also want to call out, so on the lemon garlic chicken, what's really interesting is that gray line, the control, uh, those spikes there were not associated to any kind of promotion. So that was the control. It, that traffic relied solely on organic uh, discovery. So what we found was really fascinating is that um, because our content taxonomy and the way that we surface content on the site um, uh, leads you to other content. So we, we have uh, more recipes like this. We also have on our site kind of toggles that navigate you to the next uh, most similar recipe. Um, uh, those spikes were really driven by the fact that people went to those uh, control res or the uh, treatment recipes, so those recipes that were featured in the uh, daily dish um, or as a recipe of the day, and often clicked to the, to the next related recipe, recipe in the group and then landed on, on our control recipe. It's a really fascinating way to show that um, the All Recipes audience is very um, exploratory. They're looking for uh, content not only surfaced in things like our newsletters and our recipe of the day, but they're looking for related content as well. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over um, a couple of slides here, but I'm going to go ahead and highlight um, kind of something along uh, the that theme. So what was really important for us to understand is that the recipes themselves don't only are, aren't the only um, traffic drivers. Um, one of the things that all recipes uh, cites as a differentiator is the fact that our our audience is highly active in contributing information about their recipes or about the recipes that, that they're cooking. Um, so this last slide that I, I want to show here um, highlights the additional page views driven by those uh, initial recipe views, but then also where that traffic is coming from. So the bar charts up at the top here um, show that for, for example, for the lemon garlic chicken, for every recipe page view, our users are looking at two or more reviews. So the reviews are a really important part 
of that cooking experience, that um, our, res our, our audience shares that cooking experience, the things that they, they alter um, in order to make that recipe more successful or more tailored to their particular tastes. Um, so those reviews are extremely important. Um, the photos are also extremely important, even though they don't drive nearly as many page views. Um, going back to, uh, let's see, it was the uh, – Chicken Linguini, where the content marketing without the brand ambassador intervention was the, was the winner of that particular group of recipes. Our hypothesis is, is that the photo was so much better than um, the uh, All Stars Plus content marketing that that potentially drove the success of that particular recipe. So um, to close, I just want to call out that, again, I mentioned that our, um, our deployment of our BI environment is fairly new. We're two years in, into uh, building uh, a more robust data delivery uh, process and discipline. Um, we want to maintain our speed, but really we have to begin controlling the chaos. So we have, like I said, 30 data sources published. There is no data governance, no consistency, um, but we, we understand that we wanted to compromise some of those more strict controls in order to get the information out to our teams to start making decisions. Uh, this recipe test is, is a really great example of that, that we are showing um, immediately to our teams you know, the impact of having one really good photo, how that can drive, or one really good uh, feature, a prominent feature in a newsletter, how that can drive the long-term success of a recipe. Um, we're struggling with cross-domain access, so All Recipes is part of Meredith Digital, and um, our Tableau server deployment is within the All Recipes domain, so we're working through how to uh, surface that reporting just beyond the All Recipes domain, and um, we are continuing to do uh, performance tuning. So um, connecting Tableau up to some of those large data sets is not producing um, the levels of performance we, we hope for, so we're constantly trying to figure out how to um, put together these data sources or these aggregations to make the reporting um, uh, speedier and um, really reduce kind of that uh, latency on the user side. I think in BI we're, we tend to be a little bit more patient than the typical user just because we know what's happening on the back end, um, but performance is something we're definitely um, uh, mindful of. Um, and then finally, I mean, all of this work has really been about um, self-service. So my team um, really, uh, even though All Recipes is 140 people, my team is um, tasked with um, uh, scaling what we do for all recipes across all of the other uh, Meredith digital properties. And so self-service is a big theme. We have to be able to deploy um, these reports so people can get to them, understand them, uh, trust what they're looking at. Um, and that's going to, on our part, take a lot of advocacy and training. So um, I will now um, open, uh, open things up for questions. Um, Bill, Tim, um, what kinds of questions are coming from the audience? Well, Grace, thanks so much for an excellent yeah. presentation. I must say that uh, you mentioned the Dinner Spinner app. As soon as we get done here, I'm going out to look for the Dinner Spinner app. <laughs> oh, but, good. Uh, we'll, get started with, yeah, we'll get started with today's Q&A session, and I want to thank the audience for their participation. We have a lot of uh, good questions that have come in during Grace's presentation, and we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. So during this Q&A session, I'll leave this screen up. It has contact information for Grace, should you want to get a hold of her uh, following today's webinar. So let's get started. Grace, um, a number of folks were wondering, uh, you mentioned that you used a combination of Tableau, Excel, and MicroStrategy for reporting. Uh, how much do you, uh, how much of your reporting is done on each platform, and, and how do your users then know where to look for their reports? Yeah, so like I mentioned, we are compromising speed uh, well, no, no, no. We're compromising control for speed. So we want to get these reports as fast as we can, uh, the Tableau reports as fast as we can, so that um, people have the information. 
but um, like I mentioned, we're operating in a, in a place of controlled chaos. So um, in terms of um, how people find the information right now, um, they are doing a lot of self-discovery in Tableau Server. Um, we don't have a good way to organize or we don't have a good process right now for organizing the reporting. We still have you know, a fairly limited number of reports published to Tableau Server. So really people are um, looking at the way our naming convention um, our loose naming convention to find that information. Um, but I would say at all recipes right now, um, I think I mentioned earlier in the presentation about 90% of our reporting right now is in Tableau. Um, the output of my team, very little of it is Excel. But I'll tell you, the thing that, that we're getting asked um, um, more regularly is when people are getting data from Tableau, they want to know how to export it so they can bring it into Excel. So um, I think that there's a lot of, of still um, uh, Excel usage going on. Um, MicroStrategy, um, that, that reporting is managed um, uh, through a different um, team at Meredith, and we use MicroStrategy primarily as a front end to our Teradata uh, warehouse. And um, I think MicroStrategy reporting is, is primarily our finance data. A lot of the data that requires more of the control and more of the data governance um, is being published in MicroStrategy. Well, great. Thanks. That was an excellent answer. Um, about the time you started talking about the Food Trends hot, hot sheets, we had a number of questions come in, uh, and I think these must be Tableau users, and they're wondering whether or not those hot sheets are actually Tableau output, with the question being, gee, how would you get that narrative in there? Or are you taking those uh, that the data and the, the data visualizations and loading them into something like PowerPoint to produce those reports? That's a great question. So we sort of struggled with the format because Tableau inherently is so dynamic and it's built to allow people to interact with the data. But we knew that this particular audience is really looking for quick answers and we don't want we didn't want our sales team to have to, you know, set certain parameters or filters in order to get exactly what they wanted because there, that room leaves a lot of room for for mistakes. But um, we we worked with our internal design team to completely produce these in Tableau. So um, uh, we export them as PDFs um, because not everybody has the time or willingness to go and download um, Tableau Reader and open it up in Tableau Reader. So we wanted to make these things as easily consumable by our audience as possible. So um, they are fully built in Tableau. Um, uh, we used uh, sizing to make sure that they would fit on regular 8.5 by 11 paper, and they're exported as PDFs. And we use um, the, the text box to include the annotations. So um, even though Tableau um, is really positioned and, and really uh, set up for dynamic reporting, this is an example of us kind of going, well, we really need a static report. And, um, and it really was really easy and uh, the right format for this particular audience. Oh, okay. Well, that clears up a, a number of questions immediately. Uh, you know, there are several questions that have come in that relate to um, how you can control for variables like uh, your, your viewers seeing other social media or, for example, trends like regionality or age or uh, ethnic group. Uh, and maybe this would also be uh, an interesting time for you to comment on your proof of concept machine learning project. Uh, what is it that you're trying to predict? Um, so I think I mentioned our, our um, ability to surface content that's similar to the content you're looking at. So um, internally, a lot of that, those algorithms, we have a, an algorithm that we use to identify content that's similar to other content, and we surface um, a lot of that information. But what we aren't doing very well 
And something that we want to grow is how do we surface relevant content to that particular user based on their um, their previous behavior. So um, we're, we're, our proof of concept with uh, machine learning and, and uh, Azure is um, really around um, taking uh, a user's historical data, the kinds of things that they're rating and what they're rating highly, for example, um, the content that they've looked at during that session or previous sessions, and um, tailoring the content that they see, so doing personalization based on um, their, their indicated preferences. Um, in terms of regionality, um, we use a personalization platform and have actually just started doing personalization based on, on region. Um, so we, uh, on, on our site, you'll see we kind of have these hero images, um, so kind of big feature content. Um, we recently did a test um, Featuring, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember the punchline, and it was a, a uh, surfacing different content in different regions, and there is um, a recipe for something called loose meat, which was really popular in the Midwest. And being from Seattle, born and raised in the Seattle area, I don't know what loose meat is, but uh, when we mentioned that, we, we mentioned that finding to some folks from the Midwest, they were all like, oh, of course, loose meat. And it, it performed very, uh, very well in that particular, in that particular region. <laughs> well, Grace, thanks for all those great answers. We're going to be uh, running out of time for any more Q&A right now. Uh, but for those of you who have asked questions that weren't answered today, uh, we'll be sending all the unanswered questions to Grace and the Tableau team so they can follow up with you after today's webinar. I, I have just a, a few quick announcements before we sign off for the date. Uh, please mark your calendars for June 23rd and our next Data Science Central webinar, which is Deriving Analytic Insights from Machine Data and IoT Sensors, and that's going to be sponsored by Teradata and Hortonworks. Also, today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing later today and can be found on the home page of Data Science Central in the webinar tab located at the top of the page. So this brings today's webinar to a close. I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions, and a special thanks again to Tableau for their sponsorship and our speaker today, Grace Priyong Pogbisan, for insights on today's topic. My name is Bill Voorhees. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on June 23rd. Have a great day.